Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor here at Transformation Church in Seminole, Texas, and we believe that this message is going to impact your life. The vision of our church is to establish, equip, and expand believers, so that is always in our mind behind every message and everything that we do. We also want to invite you to join us live or online Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10.30 a.m. We hope to see you soon. your Bibles. You can be seated. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalms 115 verse number 14. This is a scripture that we've been taking. We'll be continuing to take in this text for the rest of this year. Psalms 115 verse 14 and 15. I've already said this before. You will by the end of the year drop your Bible on the kitchen floor and it will open up to Psalms 115 because we've turned to it so many times. Somebody know faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. In the world that we live in, we need to hear God's will for our lives. And God's will for our lives is simply this found in verse number 14. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. How many believe that Jesus, through God, is the creator of all things? Amen. God said the word and it was created. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the mass of nothingness. God spoke the word. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, and created everything. So if we believe that, we believe that he made heaven and the earth, then we can believe that we are on the increase. Come on. We can believe we're on the increase. Look at your neighbor and say, you're on the increase. Find some else around and say, you're on the increase. God is increasing us. Hallelujah. You're there in Psalms 115. Turn over to Psalms 119, verse 32. And we've said this increase doesn't necessarily always mean that you're going to acquire more stuff. Because how many know when you acquire more stuff, you, you have to increase your responsibility for the stuff? And I believe that God's not necessarily, you know, focusing on increasing stuff, but he's really this year focusing on strengthening our structure. In order for us to receive more of God, our structure has to be strong. Can I get an Amen. Now, we've been talking a lot about that since January, and specifically, we've been in this series entitled The Heart of the Matter. And really, to strengthen our structure, it's not necessarily trying to change things in the natural realm, getting more organized, cleaning our closets, you know, make sure all the shoes, and all that's good, we're blessed with that, make sure the car is washed, and you know, here in, in Seminole, you'd have to like wash your car every day because of the dirt blowing right now. <laughs> and um, praise God for rain. Let me encourage you about rain. You know, several years ago, the Lord had put this on my heart. And he said this simply. He said, don't you know I want it to rain in Seminole? He just said it like that. He said, don't you know I want it to rain in Seminole? So why, why do you keep asking me for it to rain? And I just kind of went back. He said, there's been word curses put on Gaines County that it never rains in Seminole. He said, you got to break the curse by using your authority in the, my name, the name of Jesus. And start saying, it always rains in Seminole. Well, it's so much easier to pray for rain when you do that. But no, when you start exercising, your, why, why Jesus, when he got to the end of the boat, he said, you know, he, he speak to the wind and the waves and rebuked it. And said it to stop and cease. The disciples were freaking out because they were about to drown. But Jesus got to the end of the boat. And then he turned around and said, why ye of little faith? In essence or in context, he was trying to say, you guys could have had the same authority that I have to speak to the winds and waves and it would have ceased. Now, it is, you know, you guys know God's been ripping the religion out of me lately. And it's, it's, like I said, it's easy to pray. We pray for rain here. And I'm not saying stop praying for rain, but use your authority in prayer. Amen. Start speaking to the clouds and command the clouds to develop moisture so it can rain. Amen. We did this several years ago. Y'all remember, we've been in our church. We did, we did this several years ago. It was a weird and a horrible drought several years ago. The Lord told me this. And so we started saying that. We started declaring in the name of Jesus, we command the, the wind and the rain to come to Gaines County. And we break the word curses off our county that says the rain always goes around Seminole. I break that in Jesus' name. It always rains in Seminole. We'll see the radar, see how it just splits around us. No, stop believing the radar. Can I get a better amen than that? I mean, you know, the radar will change. It's just a matter of time. I mean, it might be 80 degrees and then 20 degrees in six hours. It will change. But God's word will never change. We just start exercising our authority that Jesus gave in his name to us. Hallelujah. I don't know why I'm on this, but it's good anyways. You know, we, we, as, we are, God's given us authority in our community. 
Amen. He's given us authority over Gaines County. We, he's given us authority in the, the place that we live. And a lot of things were, are, just, are just, you know, God's already provided a way through Jesus Christ, and he's waiting for us to do something. He's already provided. That's why Jesus on the cross, he said, it is finished. Hallelujah. We're, we're asking for God to do stuff that he's already done. It's a matter of us just exercising our authority and believing what his word says is true. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good right now. Well, several years ago when this took place, um, we were actually, me and my wife, Miss Daphne, she's in, um, in Tulsa uh, with my daughter Emily at a, at a baby shower. And uh, I know I'm too young to have grandkids. I know. I know you guys were thinking that. I know. But, um, and by the way, as you guys know, Jesus did not come back before Emily got married. I missed it. Will y'all forgive me on that? <laughs> Kill this every year. Jesus, you got to come back for Emily. Now she's about to have a baby, and I want a baby. I'm okay with that now. But anyways, and I remember several years ago, we were, me and Miss Stephanie's always had it on our heart to, you know, have a place for our family to go and kind of vacation. And, and of course, I love lakes, and, and I love fishing. Grew up at, in Breckridge at Hubbard Creek and, and the lake there, and just, just loved the lake. Daphne did too, and, and um, her uh, stepdad has a cabin at another lake. And so we were just praying about it, and just the Lord put it on our hearts. Um, to, we, I actually got an inheritance from my grandfather and through my dad, and we purchased some property at Possum Kingdom years ago. And it was during the drought, and at the time, the dock was only sitting on about two feet of water. And, um, but I knew on the inside of me, because I've been saying, rain's coming. It always rains in Seminole. This drought's got to end. And we got that land cheap, y'all. Let me know. We've got it. When it's drought and you want to buy property on the lake, good time to buy. If you believe God is going to bring the rain. Uh, people were bailing out of the, it's never going to fill up again. This lake is going to dry out. And how many know, man, Hubbard Creek was like dry over the bridge. It was dry. You can see the old road there and stuff. And, um, and I'll never forget, I started, when the Lord put that on my heart, I said, I just started speaking over Gaines County and even over the lake in the name of Jesus. It always rains in Breckenridge. It always rains in Graham, Texas. It always rains at, at Hubbard Creek. It always rains at Possum Kingdom. And guess what? It started to rain. Y'all remember, it started to rain. And as the water came up at the lake at Possum Kingdom, so did the value of my property. <laughs> Hallelujah, to where we started getting like six, seven feet of water underneath it. And the next thing you know, the property value went up, the water came in, all because, and it's not just because of me, it's just because God loves us. And God doesn't want us to be in a drought. Can I get a better amen than that? Come on, God doesn't want us to be in a drought. He wants us to have a land full of prosperity and, and, and bearing fruit. So he's already provided the way for I know some religious people are already getting uptight about this, but it's in the Word. It's the Bible. You should use, use the Scriptures. Use what God's Word says. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, not drought and death. Amen. You can't have abundant life without rain. So we just got to hook up what Jesus said. And, and so we're, we're going to start doing that more. We're going to start. We're going to continue to pray, believe God, and say, Lord, we thank you for the rain. It, all, I, I make this, it always rains in Seminole. Yes. And I know in your mind it's like, no, it doesn't. Well, that's in your mind. But in your spirit, man, you're saying some. You're calling those things that be not as though they are. Yes. That's what faith does. You call it in. Yes. And you can go through scripture after scripture after scripture. And I, I, I'm not here to teach on faith today. But I want to encourage our church. If anybody else is going to stand up for this community, let it be our church. And we're going to believe that it's always raining in Seminole. Yes. In Gaines County. And all the farmers said, Amen. <laughs> And I'm actually, I'm tired of dirt, y'all. I don't know about y'all. How many's tired of the dirt? I'm tired of blowing my nose. I'm trying to eating it. I'm trying to, I'm seeing it everywhere. I'm, I'm done with the dirt. So it's not a matter of God, would you please? God's like, I'm done with the dirt too. I mean, I want it to rain too, but I've given you authority for it to happen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus told the disciples to speak to the mountain. Don't talk about the mountain. Let's not talk about how we like rain. We need rain. No, start t speaking to the clouds and the wind. Say, no, in the name of Jesus, you've got to rain in Seminole, Texas. You've got to rain in Gaines County. Okay, so there you go. That was free. Let's get back in my notes. Praise the Lord. I had to say that. Psalms 119, verse 32. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you came to church? Amen. Psalms 119, verse 32 says this. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. This word enlarge means to make room. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to make room for God. In 2022, it's all about making room for God. Or we can say it like this, when you make room, it's another way of looking at you're on the increase. 
and we've talked about this many times already, but I want to just do a review. We must be responsible for our lives. We are the ones that make room for God. God created us all free moral agents. We choose to live the life that we want to live. God gave us that choice. Proof of that's in the Garden of Eden. He put that tree of good and evil in the middle of the Garden of Eden. He instructed them not to eat of it, but he gave them a choice. And all of us as believers have been given a choice on how to live our lives. And really, this series is all about checking your heart. Because really, how you live your life is not dependent on the neighbor you're sitting by. It's not dependent on your job. It's not dependent solely on, on your influences in your life. Really, it's how you respond to the influences in your life that determine where you're headed in, in this life, in this journey. Psalms 119, verse 32, I will run the course of your commandments. Or we can say it like this, I will get excited and run fast at your word. For you shall enlarge, make room, my heart. Now you're in the book of Psalms. Turn over to Psalms 15, verse number 10. Psalms, excuse me, Psalms 51, verse 10. Psalms 51, verse 10. The psalmist said this, David, he said this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Notice King David here, he had just had uh, been exposed with his sin with Bathsheba, and he was going through repentance, and he was asking God to forgive him. And he was basically making this, this statement, Create in me a clean heart. See, it's our responsibility to go to God whenever we've made mistakes and ask for forgiveness because forgiveness cleans the clutter of our hearts. Look at your neighbor and say, I forgive you. Come on, find somebody and say, I forgive you. And then look at them and say, will you forgive me? <laughs> will you forgive me? I don't know what I did, but please forgive me. I just want to get it out in the open right now. That way, if I do something, I've already asked for forgiveness. We're good. So um, what are you doing? You're getting that clutter cleaned out of your heart. Keep the clutter out. Come on, look at your name and say, keep the clutter out. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 20. This is where we left off last Sunday. It says, it's my son, verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart. Somebody say, keep your heart. Notice our responsibility to keep our heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. This word keep, it means to guard, it means to protect, it means to watch over. In the heart, here, specifically in this scripture, as well as many other scriptures, the heart is the innermost part of the man. It's who you really are. So it's our responsibility as believers to keep who we really are in track, to keep our guard, to watch and protect who we really are. Today I want to talk about the condition of our hearts. The condition of our hearts. The third step to enlarging our hearts or making room in our hearts is to know the condition of our hearts. Now we know this if you remodeled any houses or done anything like that. Before a remodel takes place, you must know the condition of the structure. Now um, me and Miss Daphne years ago, we bought a house in, in Lubbock. It was right before... Uh, Pastor Chris was born. He was in Miss Daphne's belly, upside down. That explains everything. No, I'm kidding. You know, he gets to preach Wednesday, and so he's going to clean all this up. But anyways, and I'll, I'll never forget, we bought this house, and a friend of mine's dad was in real estate, and um, this house was a really, really good deal. How many know when you get a really, really good deal, something's really, really wrong with it? I mean, you know what I mean, but it's a really, really good deal, you know, but it's really, really wrong. And I was correct with that assumption because when we walked into the house, this house was really owned by one person, and I think the, the person that owned this house had it built right after Jesus was born. It was old, and really where she sat, she actually passed away in this house. Where she sat, she sat in a rocking chair smoking a cigarette in the living room. And you can see the indentions in the carpet where she would just rock and smoke a cigarette. And how we knew she had smoked a cigarette is because the wallpaper that was on the walls were full of nicotine. So it was a good deal, but... It really wasn't. But I was young, you know, where I was in my you know, mid-30s, right around, or early, gosh, it was before we moved here. So I was like in my mid-20s. You know, when you're in your 20s, you think you can conquer the world. It don't matter what it is. It's a good deal. We're going to make this happen. At that time, I was working part-time at the church um, as a college director. I was throwing newspapers early in the morning, and I was working for a painter in the afternoon. So I worked to deal with a painter to use his equipment to paint this guy's house for him to redo the roof because the roof of this house 
had a hole in the back bedroom. And what I mean by a hole is I could walk into the back bedroom where it was going to be uh, Ben's room, and I could look and see the sky through the roof. I could see the clouds go by. I could see a bird come by. I mean, it was that run down. But by golly, it was a good deal. We're going to make this thing happen. And sure enough, as we went through this house and we started tearing down things, we realized that we really bit off more than we could chew. Nobody's ever gotten to a situation where you're like, oh, what did we just get ourselves into? And the reason why we didn't really sit back and look at it is because we didn't really count the cost. We just wanted to remodel it. We didn't look at the structure of it. And really, if we would have looked at the structure of the house a little bit differently, we could have remodeled it a whole lot better. This is what I'm trying to get across to you guys today is that many people are just remodeling and remodeling their hearts, but they haven't really focused on strengthening the structure. They look at just trying to cover up the mistakes that they have, the problems in their marriage, the problems in their finances, and they're just covering it up with more sheetrock or covering it up with more paint instead of really like stripping it all down to the studs and fixing the studs. And that's what I want to talk about today because really in order for us to grow, in order for us to see increase, it's going to start with us again strengthening our structure. In order for us to really enlarge, make room for God, we've got to stop covering up so much stuff. Amen. Come on, somebody. Stop covering up so much stuff and just say, you know what, it's time to rip some wallpaper off. It's time to take some sheetrock off. It's time to look at the studs and see what's wrong with the studs. Let me give another example. Do I have any hot rod guys here, like, like, all, like cars and stuff? Come on, anybody, y'all got to help me out here. I love watching uh, Motor Trend TV, and especially when the Chevys come out, because, man, they just got, I crank up the television. No, I'm kidding. Four guys were like, whatever. But anyways, and one of the things that I've seen, I've been watching uh, Dave Can Dig It, uh, his show, and I really like him up in Salt Lake. And, um, and the way he really does his, his business is that when they get an old car in, they, they take it through Media Blast, which basically is like sandblasting the car and taking it all the way down to the bare metal to see what, what's behind all of the fancy stuff. And many times in his show, you can like see that it looks good. It's like, man, we don't have to really do a whole lot to this car. It looks great. But in his business, the way he does his business, and I like this, is that it doesn't matter what it looks like. It's what's underneath it that really counts. And so he'll go to Media Blast. He'll take the frame off. He'll do all this kind of stuff. And sure enough, there's rust. There's holes in the metal. There's all kinds of things. And what happened was some of the hot rods that were, that were, that were, that he was going to fix on before he fixed on them was they just kind of covered up the mistakes. And over time, the paint starts bubbling. Any car guys know what I mean by that if you don't do it right. And as I'm watching these shows, the Lord is really just kind of impressed on my heart. And really, I don't watch these shows to get sermon material. It just God just downloads it. I like watching the shows because they're really good. And um, there's too many bleeps in so many shows. I'm like, all right, y'all don't need to use that kind of language. You, you're still in high school and you're 50 years old. Get over that language. But anyways... All right, I got off my soapbox. I feel better now. But one of the things that I was, I was watching the show, and it really impressed my heart, is, again, what Christians do, and I've seen it, I've been guilty of my own life, they think that they can cover up the rust in their life. They think they can cover up all the holes with Bondo. They can cover up all the stuff instead of going back to the bare metal and fixing the metal. And honestly, if I could just be really transparent, that's what I believe is what's happened in the body of Christ, the American church as a whole. We've got fluffy messages that are just coming up some real problems. The, 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 the American church has got some real problems, y'all. And I'm not here to bash the church. I mean, I pastor a church, so I'm not here to bash the church. But I'm here as a pastor. I'm not going to talk about the problems all the time. I want to be the one in there with a cutting torch, with a welding rod, and go back and fix whatever's been broken. Instead of going back and just saying how bad everything is. Can I get some amens up in this place? Let's not be the, let's not be the source of the problem and talk about the problem. Let's fix the problem. Amen. Let's be a part of the solution instead of the problems. One of the things that just for me as a leader that just really just, just, irrit I'll just, say it, just irritates me is when somebody just talks about the problem all the time. And then you ask them, well, how do you fix it? I don't know. I'm just going to tell you about the problem. Oh, it got real quiet right then. Uh, my, my whole, oh, I'm going to have fun today. I can already, I'm going to get down here where y'all live. Now, check this out. This is, this is what we have to have this mentality. It's, it's a hard issue more than anything else. It's one thing to reveal somebody's weakness. A lot of people can do that. 
But a real believer, somebody that's mature, can reveal weakness and help them through the process to get better. Amen. That will be willing to go through the fire with them, to be willing to go through the text messages, through the, through, through the, the prayer, through the times of going out and hanging with them and say, you know what, I know you've got some weakness. I've had some weakness too. Let's work it out together. Iron sharpens iron. Let's, let's work at this instead of saying, did you hear about Brother David? You know, if you heard about this or did you hear about Brother James? Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Instead of hearing about all this, stop being the source of the problem by elevating the problem more by, by exposing the weakness. Amen. Sure, we got to get right. We got to make sure that, that, that the first step is on that there is a weakness. But let's not sit there and elevate the weakness so much that we can't even fix the problem. We don't even know how to fix the problem. Come on, look to your neighbor, high five somebody. Be the solution. Come on, high five somebody say, be the solution. Don't come to me with problems. Come on. Unless you got solutions. I guess I'm just old school like that. My grandfather was like that. You know, Todd, don't, don't come to me with all your problems. Come with me with a solution to your problems. What do you, how are you going to fix it? I don't know. That's why I'm here with you. <laughs> well, think about it for a second. You're not dumb. That's what he would say. You're not dumb. Think about it for a second. Well, that's a good idea. I'll think about it. So I did. I started thinking about, you know what? I can start acting this way. I started doing this thing. Sure enough, the Holy Ghost will start telling me some things. And then I could go to him and say, you know what, Grandpa? This is what the Lord told me. I could do this. He goes, exactly. That's how you solve the problem. Man, this is not even in my notes. If you're on U version, you could definitely tell this is not my notes. Somebody just needs to hear this. If you got marriage problems, yeah, I'm going to go there. Come on. Sorry. If you got marriage problems, stop focusing on the weakness. You're married for a reason, to help each other out of the weakness. God anointed you. You have a covenant with God Almighty. He loves marriage. He wants your marriage to work. My mama told me this. Man, I'm getting all redneck today. But anyways, my mama told me this. She goes, it takes two to tango. And if you got one person pointing out all the weakness and other person not and all that just you, you got as a as a married couple you you got to choose it's got to be a choice that both of you have weakness and both of you need help amen. can i get a better amen than that amen. those that have been married longer than 30 years understand that i can sit there and try to change my wife she can try to change me and how I many know it don't work anybody married more than 30 years can say yep it don't work. I mean, what it work is, where it starts is when I change me. And then it starts changing my marriage. Oh, praise the Lord. Man, I'm so away from my notes. Somebody needs to hear this today. We're talking about what? Enlarging our hearts, getting our hearts right, learning the condition of our hearts. Turn to Mark chapter 6, verse 45. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example of some things here. Mark 6, verse 45. Here's a story of Jesus and the disciples. And we find here, verse 45, immediately he made his disciples to get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethesda, while he sent the multitudes away. Now, in context here, he just fed the 5,000 with, with the loaves and the fish. Verse 46, and when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the lands. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Now there's a whole lot right there, but I won't preach on that today. But check on verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For all, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat with them, to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. Check out verse 52. A lot of people stop right there, but check out verse 52. This is what I want to get to today. Y'all ready for this? Come on, look at you and say, are you ready for this? Check this out. For they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were what? Paul Harvey used to say the rest of the story for those older guys. This is the rest of the story. A lot of people want to focus on the fact that, man, they're marvel that Jesus was in the boat. He walked on water, and he got there to him and saved them all, blah, blah, blah. But check this out. The rest of the story is simply this. They did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts had become hardened. See, there's two conditions of the heart that must be revealed in order to strengthen our structure. Number one, simply a hardened heart 
or number two, a soft heart. So let's talk about a hard heart. So I told you in context of this situation, we know the story about how Jesus fed the 5,000. Let's briefly look over that so you can understand how they got to this place, how they got a hard heart. In Mark chapter 6, verse 35, you can jump up there a couple verses. Check this out. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desert place and already the hour is late. Let me say something about a hard heart because they had a hard heart. The Bible says they did. Well, how did they get a hard heart? A hardened heart always has an attitude. Now, I'm not expecting a whole lot of amens. I expect a whole lot of old me's today. You can always tell somebody that has a hard heart because they have an attitude. Notice they had an attitude. The day was far since the disciples came in and said, this is the desert place. The hour is late. Let's just go home. I can always tell in my own life when I get tired, I get an attitude. How many know some people when they get tired, they get a little attitude? It's like my three-year-old, my four-year-olds, when they get tired, they get an attitude. And now they're in their 30s and 40s and they're still tired and they still get an attitude. <laughs> Let me just say this. Everyone here works very hard on a weekly basis. We all work hard. It's not, it's not a determination if, if we work hard enough or not. That's not the question here. It's what you're doing with your extra time that is what I want to focus on. Because all of us not only just need physical rest, but we need spiritual rest. That's why it's important for you to be here on church on Sundays and Wednesdays. Because it's your time to find that spiritual rest. Because when you miss those times, you operate from a tiredness. You operate from a spiritual weak place. And when you start operating from a spiritual weak place, you'll start getting a spiritual attitude. I know nobody here has ever had one of those before, but from me, myself, I know that when I get spiritually tired, I can get a spiritual attitude. And that's what happened with the disciples here. They were tired. They were ministering. With Jesus, they fed 5,000 men, not including all the women and children. It was a mighty miracle. And now the day has come to the end. And they're like, man, Jesus, we're wore out. This is a desert place. And the hour is late. Send them away. Here's something else about a hardened heart. A hardened heart wants the easy way out. In Mark chapter 6, verse 37, but he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. I love Jesus. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread to give them something to eat? So they started giving excuses why they didn't want to do what Jesus instructed them to do. See, that's a sign of a hardened heart because they give excuses. Let me give you some quotes by some favorite or famous people on excuses. Benjamin Franklin, he said this, He that is good for making excuses is seldom good for anything else. I, the, the one that gets me the best, this is the spiritual excuse. Well, we just don't have peace in our heart. It's really an excuse because you haven't got things right in your life. <laughs> praise G. Oh, she's good. Okay, good. It, it's the truth. Well, we just don't. Anyways, praise the Lord. I'm guilty of it. I've said that myself. Where my things are not all right in my heart and I want to be spiritual. So I said, I just don't got peace about this. And really, it's my heart. Washington, George Washington Carver said this, 99% of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. See, a hard heart wants the easy way out. A hard heart always wants to give excuses. Because in Mark chapter 6, verse 37, he answered and said to them, you give something to eat. And they said to him, we should go and buy 200. They were trying to find a way out because they were tired and they just wanted to go home. But during this whole time, Jesus was trying to expose where their heart was. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, go down a little bit further there in that chapter. Check this out. Then when he saw them straining at rowing, I asked myself this question. Okay, Jesus instructed them to go across the Sea of Galilee. Now, you guys know we were there last year, the year before last, time's flying now. And um, the Sea of Galilee to me is just one big huge lake. It's not like the Atlantic Ocean or anything. It's just you can actually see the other side of it. And I could see how the disciples could row across this, this Sea of Galilee. I could see, you could see how that's possible because you realize they didn't have like a, a Volvo V8 in their, in their bass boat or anything. They, they, didn't have, they had rows. They didn't have like a trolling motor or anything to get across the lake. 
And so it was very possible for them to do this. And they, they were straining at rowing. And I asked myself this question. If Jesus instructed them to go across the, the sea, but their hearts were hardened, I'm kind of not surprised that all the wind and the waves started coming against them. This is what I've learned in life, is that when my heart's not right with God, I continually strain. It seems like I'm, 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 I'm working so hard, but I'm not getting anything accomplished. It's not necessarily the winds or the waves that called the straining. It's I had a hard heart. I know that's probably never happened to anybody here, but if you're straining right now, it might not necessarily be the job or your marriage or the kids. Where's your heart? Come on, somebody. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Jump down to verse number 50. Mark 6, verse 50. So they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. See, a hardened heart, really the root of a hardened heart, is they're full of fear. They were afraid. They thought Jesus was a ghost. They just got finished ministering with him, and then now there's a ghost walking on the water. And they kind of knew it was him, but kind of didn't. Next thing you know, he, he gets in the boat with them, and the waves and the wind cease. But prior before all that, they were straining so hard. Aren't you thankful that Jesus can look past our weakness and get us out of a mess? Aren't you thankful? So a hard heart is what we as a church must resist and not allow to take place in our life. That's why in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, it says to guard your heart. I'm not going to have a hard heart against this person. I'm not going to have a hard heart against this situation. Why? Because it affects my relationship with Jesus. Again, if you've been straining, y'all know what I mean by straining. It seems like you're doing all this stuff and all this work and you're not accomplishing anything. Check your heart. Where's your heart with God? Well, I love God. Absolutely you love God. But are you pleasing to God? It's a big difference. You guys have heard me talk about this. There's nothing we can do to get God love us more or less. His love is infinite. All he asks us to do is be obedient. And we are obedient because we love him. Where's your heart? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, where's your heart? I want to give you some signs of a soft heart. Because I don't want us to be that that kind of people that have just got a hard heart against things. Let's learn how to be a soft How many want to have a soft heart? Come on, how many want to, I want God to mold my heart. And, and I, I keep going back to this, and I will always go back to this because I'll be honest, it's more for my benefit than for you, but man, I'm, like I said, God is ripping religion out of me. And one of the things that he's ripped out of me is that hard heart. And I didn't realize I had it until revelation comes. And as I was going over these next several scriptures, the Lord just started to show me in my own heart. I'm being just really transparent. In my own heart, where I've gotten hardened in some areas. Amen. Now, I'm not in this alone, are we? How many know that there's some areas in your life that we need to soften up in? Hallelujah. Let's look at that. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. I'm going to read from the New Living's translation. There's only four of these, so we're good. We'll beat the Baptist to the steakhouse or two. It's a joke. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Well, the way I'm going, we'll probably get there after they leave. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. The New Living Translation says this. Do not use foul or abusive language. Or I like to say this. Don't cuss. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. One of the things the Lord always checks my heart with, is the words that I'm saying to others, are they encouraging them, are they building them up, or are they abusing them? Because, see, a soft heart wants to encourage others. You know, um, we like to, you know, family, we like to go out and eat and at restaurants and everything, and, and Daphne gives me a hard time. You know, she, she, I love her so much. She gives me a hard time in, in a sense that, you know, she is the people person in the family. I don't know if you guys know that. She loves to be around people. I mean, she is the party animal in the family. And uh, she just, and for me, I mean, I love being around people and everything, but I'm also the type of guy I like to be by myself. And she's just lately, and I guess it's just I'm, I'm getting older, and I, I like to have friends. When you get older, how many old people, when they get the AARP card, they suddenly just like to talk to people all the time? 
I haven't applied for that card yet, but I just haven't crossed over. I'm just there. But anyways, so we're at restaurants, and I'm finding myself talking with people like more than I usually have. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And Daphne, she goes, you're just getting old, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> and where before I would just like, all right, there's a lot of people here. Let's eat. Let's, let's, let's pay the ticket. Let's get a good tip. And let's get out of here. And now I'm like, hey, did you see that person over there? I better go say hi to them. Hey, did you see that person? Look at them. Oh, they look so cute coming in. I'm like, what am I saying? <laughs> and what is happening is that God's softening my heart towards people. When you get religion ripped out of you, it's not about you anymore. It's about encouraging others. I don't, I don't want to have my words. I don't need my words to be abusive to others and just say, well, I'm just kidding. Well, how do you know? How do you know that word wasn't abusive even though you were kidding? Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3. Here's some signs of a soft heart. A soft heart wants to be an encouragement to others. Number two, a soft heart thinks of others before themselves. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3, the New Living Translation. Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Woo, we can stop right there. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. He's been in conversations with people and and you, you ask them, how are you doing? How's things going? And for the next 10 minutes, they give you a life story. And then you want to kind of jump in and say a little bit about your life, but you don't even get a chance because it's all about their story. Oh, come on, somebody. So now he's preaching real good. Some of you are like, I'm that person. Sorry. I'm that person. See, a soft heart won't interrupt, but a soft heart knows how to be patient and let somebody else talk. You know, this thought just came to me. I really felt the Lord just, just said, this is how you be a Christian right here. This is how you be a Christian. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, straighten up. <laughs> you know, Cal to Newgate, all of that. Oh, my gosh. I got two more, too, so praise the Lord. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. How do you know you have a soft heart? You want to be an encouragement to others. You think of others before yourself. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, the New Living Translation says this. This should be your ambition, to live a quiet life. Or I like to say this, to live without drama. Amen. Minding your business. I, I say that with some southern twang. Right? Minding your business. And working with your hands just as we commanded you before. See, a soft heart knows how to mind their own business. Did you hear about them? Did you hear about them? Huh? Who cares? I love them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm minding my own business. Well, we're supposed to reach out and show the world. Absolutely, I'm going to reach and love on people, but I don't need their drama. If they want help, praise God, we'll help them, but I don't need the drama. Come on, say, drama-free zone. I want everybody almost to stand up and just do this. Drama-free zone. Why? Because I want to, I'm guarding my heart. I, I want my heart to be soft. I don't want a hard heart. Drama's going to come. It's a part of living in this world. Drama's coming. But I don't have to embrace the drama and let it change me. Amen. And lastly, since we're having so much fun today, I'm glad we ran during praise and worship because there's not a lot of running during the preaching. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse number 16. I'll close with this. Live in harmony with each other. New Living's translation. Live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act important. But enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. <laughs> I need to read that again because that was so good. Live in harmony with each other. Don't try to act important. But enjoy the company of ordinary people. Do And don't think you know it all. Hallelujah. We should never say, you don't know it all. You don't know it all. Hallelujah. Don't think you know it all. Why? And, and this is, oh, help me, Jesus. This is why I, I as a pastor, um, and even as a Christian, more so than a Christian than even a pastor, this is why 
I, I'm really watching how I say things and how I respond things to, to things nowadays more than ever. Because even though I might have an answer and a response to somebody's drama, I got to be careful if they're really ready for it or not. Y'all know what I mean by that? Because, you know, you can speak truth, but if they're not receiving it as a love, as something I love them, then they'll probably think that I'm trying to be a know-it-all. And I'm just, I'm just learning as, as a believer. I pray for, obviously, I pray for, I'm praying for, I'm praying for myself because I got a lot I could say. But I just choose to step back and say, you know what? I don't know all that's going on. I mean, I, I can be a very opinionated person, but I choose not to be. Why? Because I want to have a soft heart. It's, it's more of a heart issue for me than trying to get truth out. Anybody get anything today? Come on, anybody get anything today? Come on, it, it, it's all about the heart. If we're going to continue to see God grow us, strengthen our structure, man, it starts with who we really are. It starts with our heart. And I choose, we choose today to have a soft heart. No more hard hearts. We're going to let God soften our hearts today.